yes so we are starting today's class uh, we are about to see uh, some worksheet solution for the electricity class this is the first class after the uh, results came out and i have had my episodes so just for a quick recap i'm going to give you some very small revision for what we did do in the earlier classes it's going to be pre pretty uh, uh, sm uh, pretty precise so keep the lookout we have defined two new terms compared to uh, in our AS level. One of them is called stress, which is shown by the symbol sigma, which is given by force per unit area, has a unit of Pascal. We would define an, another new term, which is called strain, which is shown by delta, uh, this like bangla tho without the matra, uh, uh, which is given by amount of extension, which is let's say delta L, you have by L. Sometimes delta L can be also written as E as well. So E representing the extension and extension. So that is also possible. Out of these two, th these two quantities, we have defined a new third quantity, which is called the Young's modulus of the property, Young's modulus of the material of an object, which was defined as the ratio of the stress versus strain of that material only up to the point as long as Young's modulus has a fixed value. Young's modulus having a fixed value means this ratio remaining fixed, which means if we try to plot a graph of stress versus strain of an object, as long as this graph remains a straight line, as long as this graph remains a straight line, this Young's modulus is a measurable, definable single value quantity for that material. So that value of the straight line part, the gradient of the straight line part of the sigma delta graph is gonna be determined or defined as the Young's modulus of that material. The end point of this, of this straight line part is what we call the limit of proportionality. This is a geometric point, geometric property of the graph. The end point of the straight line is called the uh, limit of proportionality. So we have one significant point, of, uh, significant point over here. After, after the curve, uh, after the straight line part finishes, the graph starts to take a bit of curve. It tends to lose gradient. And then it slowly, it is to have maximum peak. And then from the maximum peak, uh, many different specimens can start many different uh, fate from, from this point. We can have a lot of different variations and we can have the breaking occur at different positions. Any point? A portion quantity. The end point of the straight line part is called the limit of proportionality. Slightly inside the curve, there is a point which determines the reversible or irreversible behavior of the specimen. So, this point is what we call the limit of elastic limit. We call it elastic limit. The elastic limit represents that if applied force is removed while the force is still within this limit or the stress is within this limit, the object can retract back to its original dimensions perfectly without having any permanent deformation. It can completely retract back its original dimensions. This point lies somewhat slightly inside the curve, not exactly on the straight line for metal objects. Beyond the elastic limit starts the plastic region. Plastic region means that whenever we'll deform an object beyond this part, beyond the elastic limit, the object will undergo No. To be honest, this is the exactly same thing. He had only the ex uh, the the two ex two, two excess values are of uh, of uh, I mean changed. So extension Okay, Dr. Parabol, this is Shishkuri. 
So elasticity limit is the positive is the point till which we have uh, elastic deformation, and then beyond the point of elastic deformation, we have plastic deformation. Plastic deformation represents the amount of uh, plastic, plastic deformation means that if we deform an object beyond the elastic limit, the object will not be coming back to its original dimension when deforming forces are removed completely. Some deformation will still be left, and that's what we call permanent deformation. However, the object would still be the same object made up with the same material. So whenever the force would be removed from a specific point in the plastic region, the object will always come back to its original dimension following a parallel line with the straight line portion of the original graph. So these two lines, no matter where you retract it from, these two lines will always be parallel, giving you an intercept on the x-axis. And this intercept value of the x-axis is essentially what we call the permanent deformation. That much part is for the information of the graph. The other thing that we have to understand that if we have a graph that is drawn for force versus extension, and if we have a graph that is drawn for stress versus strain, for appropriate scales, stress versus strain, the shape of these two graphs would be always equal, always similar. The reason is that y equals to fl by ae is actually divide, uh, sigma divide, uh, this, uh, this uh, ratio comes up to give us this format y equals to fl by ae. So in our syllabus, y is considered a constant. No, actually, y is actually a constant. In our syllabus, the initial cross-sectional area of the specimen is also considered to be constant. There is a reason for this. Uh, first of all, this deformation was not introduced as a variable in your equation so that we don't have to go for uh, three-dimension uh, three changing scenarios. And also, we were trying to figure out the mathematical calculation for a very small percentage of strain for which the change of cross-sectional area would be very small. That's a practical reason, but it's not entirely accurate. Uh, considering the cross-sectional area, initial cross-sectional area of the specimen remains intact is somewhat like considering air resistance being negligible or stuff like that but air resistance is actually not negligible. It is always present. I mean, all, if you're moving through air, you're, it is always present, more or less, but it is always present. So constitutional area does get changed. So if we are considering this constitutional area to be a uh, constant, and this is initial length, initial length is, an, is, a, is a quantity which will always be a constant. So ultimately what we're getting that this is a constant, this is a constant, uh, this is a constant, this is also a constant. So what we are having left, we have a constant, let's say k1 uh, equals to uh, f into k2 divided by, let's say another constant, k3 into e. So we have all the constant um, uh, given up over here. So I can very well cross multiply this thing and I can write that f equals to, let's say, another constant, let's say, capital K into E. That is possible for me to write as, as a combination of all the individual constants. Uh, so that is basically what we know for to be the Hooke's law. So force proportional force equals to K or force proportional to extension and sigma proportional to uh, uh, delta or stress proportional to strain. They both pretty much will have the same shape of graph if you are plotting on this thing. There are multiple different differences over here. The gradient of this graph is what we call the spring constant which is the uh, output of the Hooke's law. The gradient of this graph is what we call the Young's modulus for the straight line part. The area under this graph gives us actual energy. The area under this graph gives us actual energy. But what is really important that we need to, whenever we are trying to calculate the area under this graph, we have to be very careful for converting the units in appropriate uh, SI, SI unit. For example, if this force is plotted in uh, kilonewtons or meganewtons or giganewtons, we have to use that appropriate tense power. If this extension is given millimeter, centimeter, or some other smaller quantities, we have to convert that power part uh, in, with appropriate uh, tense power as well. 
So area under four succession graph, this us, gives us energy stored within the specimen. Whereas area under the stress strain graph gives us energy stored in the specimen per volume. This is this gives us uh, a kind of it are area equals to what's say energy or it are AI equals to what's energy stored par volume. So, a hoche basic differences and mathematical calculation procedure. Jato to karma last last a porcelain. A to kui hoche mother primarily like be. Yeah, put up chapter mathematics gula karar juno. There's a bit much additional stuff that we will require <coughs> to proceed through this chapter. Uh, she additional part blame both. A to hoche primarily mathematics karar juno darker. Ekta hoche j. The, one of the first thing that we need to un, uh, understand slash remember is primarily objects are of three types. One is what we call the brittle objects. Brittle objects have very little or no plastic region whatsoever. So their graph is uh, examples of brittle uh, material is uh, glass. Very common example. Uh, metals can also be brittle. If they are, they have a very, a very, uh, they have the, depending upon the alloy constituents, for example, cast iron tends to be brittle, which means that you cannot beat it into other shapes. Yeah, it will literally shatter into pieces or it will crack up. Uh, that's basically, uh, that happens for uh, the iron content, uh, that, that happens whenever the cast iron has too much high of carbon content within them, and which is basically considered an impurity. Beyond the above a certain limit, <laughs> some certain limit, the carbon content in iron alloy makes it brittle. So cast iron can be pretty brittle. This is actually the case that happened uh, for the sinking of uh, Titanic. The metal panels that the corporation made, they were ordered to make were too many over a very short period of time uh, because they really wanted the ship to be get done uh, within a short amount of time. And uh, because of that time shortage, this people in the company they did not took enough care to make sure that the carbon content of those panels the body panels uh, would were actually correct so other than making the steel strong they actually somehow pour more carbon because there was no very uh, hard quality checking and whenever the iceberg actually hit the titanic ship other than smashing and bending the shape it practically cracked open the entire uh, the proportion of the bottom part uh, like like glass it shattered that's what happened i mean that's one of the output of the investigations post the titanic got sunk anyway i i gave you a bit of a historical background to give an idea that why is that can be important for us so brittle substances has almost no or very little plastic, uh, very very little elastic region, a very little uh, plastic region. Uh, typically, the, the graph for brittle substances will be finished in a perfect straight line. So, if we have a, if we do draw a force extension graph or a stress strain graph, brittle stuff substances will be finished at the end of a straight line. This is possible, or in some cases, brittle substances can have some other brittle substances can have a perfect straight line then right at the point where they are supposed to have their elastic limit that's basically what they're gonna crack so this is gonna be the breaking point or this is gonna be the breaking point they might have little curve or they might have no curve at all that's the property for brittle substance they will be mostly straight straight line and they'll be uh, break under uh, extreme pressure or extreme force application malleable substances or ductile substances are the name of two different properties uh, ductility is the property of some material to be able to undergo large plastic deformation under the effect of tension. Tension means pulling load. For example, a uh, copper wire that can be made thinner by pulling it on two sides. So you uh, can make a certain cylindrical shape, a copper wire thinner if you pull it on either side. That's called ductility. The ability to undergo plastic deformation without breaking under the effect of 
tensile load or tension. Alternately, the ability to undergo large amount of plastic deformation without breaking under the effect of compressive load or squeeze that is called malleability. They are both represent they both represent the same material property, which is called uh, the plastic a large plastic behavior or large amount of capability to withstand plastic be plastic uh, deformation. But depending upon what type of force are we applying, we they have two different names. One is ductility and this malle malleability. So basically speaking, ductile materials and malleable materials are those which always have a pretty large amount of uh, of plastic sorry pretty large amount of plastic deformation within their on, on their stress strain graph or sigma delta graph and that pretty much include all the metals because metals tend to have uh, quite a large plastic uh, plastic region which means they can be uh, pulled into shape or they can be bend or squeezed into shapes without breaking them uh, and that can they can still withstand their geome uh, geometry i mean they can still maintain their molecular integrity which means they're not gonna crack or they're not gonna tear apart they're still gonna be a con one continuous thing it's possible for us to achieve that however uh, for this because uh, whenever any object is is uh, deformed Beyond the highest point of the stress strain graph, this highest point of the stress strain graph has a name, is called the UTS point or ultimate tensile strength of that specimen or ultimate tensile stress of that specimen. <laughs> Up to this point, the object shows plastic behavior, but it behaves to be stable. Beyond this point, what we start is called the necking. Necking means the ununiform. Uh, Ununiform, non-uniform, uh, uniform non-uniform, 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 non non-uniform. Beyond this point, we have non-uniform deformation of the object along its length. So some parts become more thin compared to other, and the locations where it gets more thin is where the stress get higher. So higher stress makes it more uh, undergo deformation, so it thins up even more. Which means basically it works like a vicious cycle of force and uh, stress and strain. Uh, these are the locations which get uh, squashed up or get smaller in significantly smaller in diameter uh, as the object slowly uh, is pulled apart. In those cases, these are the locations where the object will break after a while, and this process of having to develop. Uh, very small cross-sectional area. This process of developing the small cross-sectional area, I mean, that this, this uh, arbitrary thinning process in a certain location or in a random location along the length is what we call the process of necking. Uh, necking pretty much represents that an object is pulled to its uh, extreme limits of instability. It is pulled to its instability. So an object would be mostly safe. to silent korba. It is mostly uh, considered uh, stable or, or practically usable as long as it is within the UTS limit. So that is another important information. So this is the shape for the uh, uh, brittle substances. Then we have ductile or malleable. Which can be the graph for any metals. So I did draw this over here. So not gonna draw this again. And the third thing that we can have is what we call the polymeric substances. The polymeric substances are basically the rubber substances, which are made up with long chain molecules. 
they have a pretty uh, non-standard behavior compared to beetle substances or malleable substances or ductile substances. They tend to give us a stress strain graph or a force stress strain graph that is entirely curved. So their stress strain graph apparently looks like this. Uh, following this one, there, there might be a, a cross point over here. Uh, if we uh, stretch out a, a, a polymer substance too much, there might be a cross point over here. Uh, because of my hand drawing, it is apparently looking that this graph is starting to be uh, to be tangent with the y-axis, but it will never be tangent with the y-axis. Uh, any stress graph becoming being tangent with the y-axis would mean that it is vertical at that at that instant. And that would give us infinite Young's modulus, which is not possible. <clears throat> so it gives us a curve like this. And interesting enough, whenever polymer substance is loaded, it means it is it is deformed under the effect of force, either compressive load or tensile load, doesn't matter. It is deformed. It takes one path to go up to this deformation. And when it is pulled backwards, it takes a different path. So it does not follow the exact same path as it is deformed it, as, the, as the applied force is removed. So this behavior is what we call hysteresis, not to take the same exact path while rising up and while falling down. Uh, this is what we call hysteresis. And this loop that we have created over here, this slice is what we call the hysteresis loop. And the, if, 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 the, if this was drawn on a force per uh, force extension graph, the energy of the graph, uh, uh, the area of the energy, uh, graph is actually energy, only energy. Then this slice, the area of this slice would represent the amount of energy that is stored within the specimen, a uh, polymeric specimen for every completed cycle of loading and unloading. So for every cycle of loading and unloading, while loading, the object would store the area under the loading curve. Let's see this is the unloading curve. So, and then when unloading, it will give up <coughs> the area under the unloading curve. So the amount of energy, that is the difference of these two areas, which is basically the area of the slice, this amount of energy would be stored within the material for every, after every cycle. So that's how the polymer substances would behave. Uh, one of the physical explanation for what hysteresis is, can be explained in a, with a pretty interesting part of this graph. I mean, try to think about it. Whenever we are trying to uh, deform a uh, polymeric substance, let me zoom on in this figure a little bit. It'll be helpful for us to see. Okay. So whenever we are trying to deform <coughs> uh, uh, a polymeric substance, let's say we are now applying the force uh, and we are trying to load it up with uh, with force. Let's say we have applied this amount of force, and under the effect of this amount of force, let me use a different color. Under the effect of this amount of force, in the loading process, the object gave us this mass extension, which means this is one value of the extension for the applied force in this case. And as we keep on loading, 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 it goes up to here. Let's say it didn't break up to this point. We didn't we didn't actually tear it apart. And then we started removing the force. Then we started removing the force. So if you start removing the force, the object is going to follow a one different path. And the point where we'll get to the exact same load over here, that load happened to give us a new value of extension on this path. For example, during the unloading, unloading, unloading part, that same value of force is going to give us a different value of extension. So let's say this is the extension for na. This is the extension value This is the extension value for uh, during loading. And this is the extension value during unloading. Under the effect of the same, uh, same force. So what does this figure essentially tell us? Or what does this information tell us? This information tells us that while loading, the object would give us a smaller extension under the effect of a bigger force, which means it will deform less under the effect of the force. While unloading, it would have a much bigger amount of deformation under the effect of the same amount of force. So this, what, what this goes on to mean is that whenever you're increasing the force, there's a 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 Newton, you're increasing the force and doing an experiment. 
you're gonna get this value of extension. This is the loading curve. And then you're starting to re reduce the forces and taking your measurements once again, let's say you have increased it up to uh, 200 Newton, and then you're reducing it by 10 Newton and taking the re measurements once again. For the same value of force, you'll end up with having a bigger amount of extension. So this goes on to show that apparently the object is showing some reluctancy uh, or object is showing some uh, what can I say? Uh, laziness, in other words, uh, to come back to its original shape, original dimension. Uh, under the same effect, the same amount of force, it is showing us more deformation while unloading. And this uh, this reluctance of getting back to its natural shape is also what we can call the uh, hysteresis. That's another way of physically explaining what hysteresis is. So I give you two different ways to define hysteresis. One is that the object tends to retain some of its uh, deformed behavior or object tends to uh, remain more deformed under the effect of same force while unloading compared to loading. This behavior is hysteresis. That's one way you can explain that. Or the other way we can explain this is that whenever a polymer substance is loaded and unloaded, it follows two different paths. This behavior of following two different pathways and on the stress strain graph or on the force distribution graph is called hysteresis. So you could either explain it in both terms, which works either way. So that's for the uh, hysteresis part. Uh, one of your friend, Anaf Islam, he actually showed me one of this picture, uh, sent me one of this picture in the group sharing mechanism, which I believe I can find. Yes. So he actually sent me one of these figures. This is actually, uh, this is this can be pretty interesting for us as well. Uh, what you can see over here, this is a typical graph shape for a uh, material, uh, but in this case, the excess systems are flipped. What you can see over here is that this is uh, the drawn graph for extension versus force. But we have typically used to for force versus extension. That's what I've been always telling you. So, A more commonly known version that we have come across for this graph would be the force versus extension graph. So if I just revert this graph uh, to get me a reversal of these two forces, let's say I'm gonna copy this up, take it up over here. And if I just try to do some Thing. I didn't do anything, did I? No. I want this to go over there. So first of all, I need to. So yeah, this is the typical shape that we are used to for the force extension graph. This is the typical graph that we usually get for the force extension, force extension graph. So this is basically the reversal of the two axes gives us a graph like this. So uh, what is important for us to understand uh, the points which are highlighted for your syllabus. I'm not really proficient at describing what each and every single point of this, point, of this graph point. I don't know them. So I'm not gonna take the botheration to tell you. Uh, the points that you are supposed to know, first of all, there is the end of the straight line part of the graph, which is called the limit, uh, limit of proportionality. There is a slightly inside point, which is called the elastic limit, uh, representing the distinction point between reversible or non-reversible uh, deformation or elastic deformation plus deformation. Then we're gonna have a pretty large plastic behavior. The highest point on the plastic behavior, which gives you the maximum y-axis value, is what you call the UTS point. Basically, we have these three points available. So one is the limit of proportionality, one is the elastic limit, and there's the UTS point. 
and then at some point the object is gonna rupture or break under the effect of floating so this is power deformation point d so that's basically the, this graph extension objects elastic force versus extension so what this actually shows us that if we are applying force and deforming this object this dropping down would mean to make further extension from this point further we would require even less force compared to what we did require here this happens because from this point we have the necking get started necking means you have a smaller cross-sectional area and a very specific cross-section of the uh, entire length of the specimen if you have a small cross-sectional area, the strength of the material, the ability to withstand deformation or, or oppose deformation of the material is the least at that cross-section because that is the thinnest part of the material. So the entire strength of the whole specimen will be determined by the strength of that least strength region. It's like a chain that the, a, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link, something like that. So that's why beyond the UTS point, the objects tend to become easier for us to deform or or we can say that under the effect of same force, it would extend easily or to be achieved a much bigger amount of extension, the required force would go down because the object would not have the same physical dimension anymore along its entire length at some point or at some points it's going to start to thin up that's why the required force is going to become less that's why this graph starts to fall down uh, on the force axis it does not mean that we are going to achieve more extension by applying less force i'm oh, sorry uh, it does exactly mean that we're going to be able to achieve less extension with applying uh, more extension with applying less force it is only because we don't require that much force to achieve that higher higher, higher extension because the whole specimen is not retaining its original dimensions anyway. Bujaya sir. So yield point, uh, yield point is one of the difference key. Uh, I'm going to know. I honestly don't know. I can't unmute myself. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. Okay, Hey, unloading is a possible straight line. Out of here, draw 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 line. Did I can answer. So typically, well, yes, ideally yes. Uh, but usually, I'm not the, uh, usually, I mean, as per your syllabus, it is applicable all the way up to uh, the breaking point because that's they haven't given you any specific information for your uh, course book. Uh, but more practically, it is applicable up to the UTS point because whenever you have bent an object beyond the UTS point, you have developed some necking within the specimen. Having a, a specimen that has already developed necking would be very hard for us to deform uniformly under the effect of a force. Because in that case, if you have necking within an object, I mean, try to visualize, you have a long specimen where you have some places where it, where it is thin. If you start to deform it, that object will essentially come more extended within the thin part. So if we have already developed necking, it's pretty unlikely. But then again, for the sake of caution, uh, if you have deformed some object over here and you start removing the force from this point, you should as well draw that, uh, that line to which should be, uh, be perfectly parallel with the original straight line part of the graph. The answer is yes. Okay, sir. And also for other parts over here as well. For example, if you have something over here, it might as well have a graph like this. 
uh, if it might here it might have error like this. So anywhere, if we start removing the uh, deforming load uh, from the object at any point of the deformation process, uh, the returning graph <coughs> should be a straight line that should be originally uh, that should be parallel to the original straight line part of the specimen. So I actually do explain this graph in the convenient uh, axis orientation that I am used to or that is easier for me to explain because I've been teaching it like this for the entirety of my career. But they can very well give you this kind of reverted shapes as well. This is a, a, a important information that you should take in. That in this case, the force extension graph is over here. Now, one more thing that I'd like to show you for this graph, for this relevance, actually, it's a very good thing that I remember something very important that at Inshkalgor, whenever we have the force extension graph, whenever we have the force extension graph, we usually, if we have this much, uh, if I say that what is the amount of energy uh, energy stored in the specimen when the object is under this much force, you could very well find out the area of the triangle over here and this much, this is your energy stored. Whereas if we have a force versus length graph of an object, let's say we have an object that is uh, deformed under tensile load, and we have the force versus length of the object. This graph should never start with zero origin uh, because under effect of zero force, the object should not have zero length. It should have some initial length to begin with. So let's say this is the initial length uh, where the force applied is zero. And then from this point onwards, we start to have a straight line which goes on like that. So in this scenario, it is pretty important for you to understand that I say in this scenario, this part represents the original length of the object. Let's say I'm going to represent this as L0. And from this point onwards, it shows us that the uh, amount of extension. So any, so if you consider the force extension graph, this is basically the start of the extension. It will hold a graph irrelevant space. So if you're trying to calculate the energy stored on the specimen, let's say when the length of the object is, let's say this much, if the question tells you that, what is the total energy stored when the length is this much? Then you have to drop a triangle up over here and the total amount of energy stored would be area under this triangle. This similar logic is applicable if sometimes they revert the whole axis system. Let's say if they give the length on the on the y-axis and force on the x-axis, then your graph should start from the y-axis intercept and should have a shape like this. In that case, the area under the, in that case, the energy stored in the specimen should be the area between the graph and the y-axis. The vertical drop would not be applicable because we are trying to find out how much energy was stored for that extension or for that length change, not for the entire value of the length axis. So it's important that you understand which part of the graph that I'm, that the question is referring to, depending upon observing who, how they have oriented the axis, uh, uh, axis quantities on the certain question. So that can be slightly perplexing in, at times if you don't know this from beforehand. Uh, well, in many cases, kids do mis make mistakes even if they do know beforehand that they're supposed to be careful. I'm just trying to give you some heads up that these type of things may show up and we have to be cautiously careful to handle them properly. That's what I'm trying to do. That's pretty much it for the revision part for the LSC chapter that I wanted to do. Uh, now I'm going to start solving some paper two questions uh, to give you some ideas. And I'll let you attempt some paper two questions <coughs> uh, uh, on the screen so that you can try to do some in your own as well. Let me find out something. What is the difference? Oh, that's the difference. Sister, it is possible that glass is more elastic than rubber. Yes. The distinction lies how you process the word elastic in your head. What do you mean by elastic? Or how do you understand by the word elastic? More elastic would mean what? Hmm. 
seven is good. Uh, I'm gonna try. I want you to add in question number seven, seven B to be exact. So this is a question that I have. Should I maximize this? Does it help? Should I maximize this and take it into hundred percent? Kids, can you read the whole question now? I mean, is, is the font readable? Font size readable? But it is a poor texture that I actually the house and a the Why is it so difficult? I said that I'll take it. I mean, paint it in a poor asset court to buy it. problem nope no significant improvement that I can bring about I cannot make this go away and you only have a 66 percent zoomed in view so laptop you know. never mind Question taken the poro, and then it says that uh, sorry, PDF full of the even now. Happy to be called the evil. Classes is going to be a classic class, so check out the problem. That's okay. 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 That's so still where is clamped blah 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 a do watch information it are it take up or as a hot check a can a acha so make it 98 percent does that help yay i don't guess now we can see the entire question properly a question that to try color This is an interesting question because it's slightly reverse mechanism and you really need to think it through to be able to process that.
B1 parso. Bolapan. B1 tak kira kaya se. So try chi. Acha, dah ko. We want to more or less you to a method the power possible mathematically called like her color yeah she doesn't know that they have but you can think of a possible formula to do work it by you can uh, work for by internet method as well which is gonna be okay
Biwan ki pasto. Nasa. I mean, I can take your help, Kori, so that uh, you can try this question. I really want all of you to try this question with uh, uh, with time as well, so that the change in length of the wire, if it were allowed to contract as it cools from 650 Kelvin to 300 Kelvin, it would be 2.6 millimeter. Have a look at what I don't understand. This is a framework, rigid support system. We have a metal wire, steel wire, which has a uniform construction area of something. We heat it up uniformly to 650 Kelvin. Then we it clamped it. It was clamped between these two rigid supports firmly as shown. It means currently it is wire's temperature is 650 Kelvin. At this temperature, there is no force within this object to retract back, which means at 650 Kelvin, the length of the wire is 0.62 meter. This is at a higher temperature. The wire is straight but not under tension and the length between the support is 0.62 meter. The wire is then allowed to cool to 300 Kelvin. So from 650 Kelvin, now we are allowing the wire to cool under uh, up to 300 Kelvin. So it's now gonna start to cool off. But as it is gonna cool off, naturally it is gonna try to become shrinked. It is gonna try to contract because it is becoming uh, it is becoming cooler, so it is becoming le uh, of less temperature, so it will contract. But because of the rigid support system that we have attached it with, it cannot contract. It will undergo physical deformation. So here is the deal: it is trying to trying to contract, but it is not allowed to contract. So what essentially has to happen? The object has to undergo some amount of extension. Man, I'm using this. Ah, 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 was in was this much long naturally when it is it say it's let's say it's cooled it cools down by 100 kelvin let's say when it is supposed to be 550 kelvin the length of the wire is supposed to be this much long but this amount of length is something that we did not allow because we clamped this entire red wire across two rigid supports which means even at a lower temperature, the length of the wire is exactly the same, but it was supposed to be small. So here's the deal. The amount that it was supposed to be, it's supposed to be its original length at this temperature, because of the support system, rigid support, it cannot, could not achieve that smaller length. Now, which means the difference of those two lengths gives you the extension. It means if at a lower temperature, the object is still big enough as the rare object, as a red wire, for example, let's say the green wire, is supposed to be this much small, but because of the support, rigid support, it could not contract. It is still maintained at the same sh shape, let's say up to here, which means that much difference of those two length of wires was ex is exactly what your extension is. Normally contract kora kotha, but at karaksibole contract korte parte sena. Tamar joto temperature kome jachche, tar bhitore continuously ekta contraction at a tendency produce which means that this is trying to become smaller but it not is allowed to become smaller which means it is basically being deformed or extended or it is being uh, elongated by application of physical forces hello yes, so I boot check concept. Now we respond. Yes, I I need to make sure that a idea to put you on the transfer. Can you extend? Okay. 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 We have clamped the hot wire into the clamps at high temperature. We are going to allow it to cool down. Naturally, its tendency would have been to become smaller in length. But it cannot become smaller because we have clamped it. So the amount of length that it is now bigger 
than what it is supposed to be at a lower temperature is basically its extension. Let's say, I, if, I, if I just have to assume, we can actually physically calculate this out. Uh, let's say at a certain lower temperature, the length of this wire, if it was allowed to contract freely, it means if it was not clamped across to end, let's say at a lower temperature, the length of this wire is supposed to be, let's say 0 0.55 meter. It was supposed to be that. But because of the whole, 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 uh, whole rigid support system, it could not become 0 0.55 meter. How much it is even that at that point? This is 0 0.62 meter because of the rigid supports, which means even at a lower temperature, when the length is supposed to be smaller than this value, 0 0.62, you still have this much length available, which means the amount of length that you have bigger than what you are supposed to have is working as your extension. So if the original length is supposed to be, let's say 5.5 meter, as uh, 0 0.55 meter, and now you have an extended length of 0 0.62 meters, so if you do the subtraction, 0 0.07 meter is what your effective extension at the temperature is. We are not essentially achieving that extension by applying increasing load. What we're doing, we heated up the wire, and then we clamped it together, and then allowed it to cool off, which, which is slowly, building up the, uh, that uh, that value of force because as temperature is dropping down the wire is trying to contract more and more strongly because that's how materials do with low temperature but we are simply not allowing it which means we have extended the wire thermally before now we are allowing it to contract by losing temperature as a result the force is being built up on the true support system naturally I think so. So, question number B1 is pretty simple to do. B1 was to show that the change in the uh, length of the wire, if it, you are allowed to contract as it cools, is from 560 Kelvin to 300 Kelvin, would be 2.6 millimeter. Have a look at this information. When the wire is allowed to contract freely, a one meter length of wire decrease in length by 0 0.012 millimeter for every one Kelvin decrease in temperature. So that's basically an information that we can use for our uh, unitary method. So we are trying to show that the change in the length of the wire, if we were allowed to convert x square, it goes from 60 Kelvin to 300 Kelvin would be 2.6 millimeter. So 2.6 millimeter has to be on the right. With this one that we want to show. So I'm going to write up this information. One meter length, one Kelvin, 0 0.01 meter. So if I write this information for uh, unitary method, one meter length of wire reduces for one Kelvin temperature drop by 0 0.012 millimeter. That's the first set of information. I put the 0 0.012 on the right. So therefore, uh, 0 0.62 meter for a drop of 350 Kelvin gives us how much? This should be 0 0.012 multiplied by 0 0.62 multiplied by 350. If you just wonder where did this 350 come from, you have to understand one thing that this one Kelvin is that is not the absolute temperature of the wire. 350. This one Kelvin is not the absolute temperature of the wire. This, this one Kelvin is the temperature decrease. Have a read at this instead, at this statement. When the wire is allowed to contract freely, a one meter length of wire decreases in length by 0 0.012 millimeter for every one Kelvin decrease in temperature. So for one Kelvin decrease, you are having that variation. Now in this equation, we are allowing the wire to cool from 650 Kelvin to 300 Kelvin. So the total amount of decrease in temperature was 350 Kelvin. So we use that information over here. And we do the multiplication. It equally approximate answer 2.6 millimeter as so you're gonna use that. You're gonna uh, have it shown because this is our show question that shows that how much it's gonna be. 
then it says the young smallest of the the young smallest of the steel wire steel is 2.0 to 10 to the power 11 pascal calculate the tension calculate the tension Achha. calculate the tension in the wire at 300 kelvin assuming that the wire always hooks long so if the wire always hooks low means i mean because the reason they have mentioned this information is so that you do understand uh, we are still operating within the straight line part of the force extension curve or we're still operating within the straight line part of the stress strain curve it's important because only within that part the young's modulus equals to stress by strain uh, and a fixed value of young's modulus is applicable because the question has already given you the value of young's modulus and you have the cross sectional area information exactly at the beginning of this question have a look at over here b number first paragraph still aware of uniform cross sectional area this much is done something 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 so we can have those two information and eventually go ahead and calculate out this formula so the formula that we're going to need for here is y equals to fl by ae or you can write y equals to f by a divided by l by e e by l and then you can go do the whole calculation once again so y equals to fl by ae bucket to try call a to go to the mother para gotha number three take you have over this is what i really want you to attempt i really want you to think about number three i will help you but please do think about number three কোশ্চেনের মানে কি বুঝা যাচ্ছে কি বলছে ওরা দ্য আলটিমেট টেনসিল স্ট্রেস অফ স্টিল ইজ 20 মেগা পাসকাল সরি 250 মেগা পাসকাল ইউজ দিস ইনফরমেশন এন্ড ইওর অ্যানসার ইন টু টু সাজেস্ট হোয়েদার দ্য ওয়্যার উইল ইমপ্যাক্ট ইজ ব্রেক অ্যাজ ইট গোস ইজ ইট গোনা ব্রেক হাউ কুড ইউ শো দ্যাট calculating the force <laughs> maximum force actually to be honest we can go for three different ways to solve this problem there are three different ways we can go for this one of the ways that we that i can tell that we can go ahead and try to calculate the actual stress that builds up within this situation for example uh, you can go ahead and try to calculate that what is the actual stress that is built up within the specimen for those for the given scenario you know the value of tension at 7b2 you have the value of tension and then you have the cross sectional area available so if you do the ratio you're going to be able to calculate the uts value your calculated value of st available stress from those two numbers tension from here this answer and the cross sectional from here would be quite bigger compared to this 250 megapascal so you could say since the calculated stress is higher so it will indeed break if it is smaller than uts value then you could say it would be not break that's one way to go for the other thing is that you could use this ultimate tensile stress value and use the cross sectional area to calculate 
how much force should be maximum for the steel wire to withstand bujo this is the actual available force theoretically calculated available force to be existing within the wire if it, if this cooling process actually happened i mean it might happen might not happen we don't know yet so if if, it, if the cooling process actually happened this is the amount of built up force should that should exist within the specimen however because the uh, because we are trying to compare whether this will be actually achievable or not uh, what you can do the for the second step you can try to compare these two forces so you can calculate the what is the possible maximum force that this specimen is able to produce that should come as a product of ultimate initial stress multiplied by the cross sectional area because ultimate initial stress is the highest point of your graph highest means the bigger highest value of y axis value so highest point of the graph yields the biggest amount of force uh, 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 opposing force against the deforming deforming uh, deforming load so you can manipulate these two var variables and calculate the what is the maximum force that the specimen could possibly give out what you'll find out the product of these two number uh, the uh, area of cross section over here and the uh, hs value the product of these two number is going to be somewhat smaller smaller yeah is going to be somewhat smaller than what you what you are getting over here which means your calculated tension is significantly larger compared to the value of force that the object should be able to provide for its dimension this would essentially mean that the object should not be able to go up, uh, go up and provide this amount of high amount of force i mean this force is going to be bigger compared to this force over here so that should prove us that this procedure would essentially break the wire am i saying it right this will break the wire right yes sir exactly so there's a second way that you uh, the first way is that you could calculate the available stress in the wire for the current scenario the second way is that you could calculate out the force in the in the wire the third way is that you could possibly calculate out what should be the length uh, is there a way we can calculate the length we have the value of uts no calculating the length would not be a good idea because we do not know why it breaks we only have the value of uts point no there are only two different ways you can go for it you can either either calculate the uh, compare the uts values or you could compare the forces and that should give you your answer bolon ek ek calculation karo shobai i'm going to we're going to take a small break for magri pair we're going to resume class at uh, what 7.05 7.06 something around that and it says that it was the material is ductile or brittle or polymeric all obviously say uh, ductile material because this is a straight line graph where there is no curved point whatsoever so the end point is pretty much the breaking point so this is our breaking point so that's the straight line curve brittle substances and then it says to measure the young's modulus which why you have to essentially go to calculate out the young's modulus of this graph which means you are supposed to find out the stress over strain so because this is a straight line and this is origin going straight line Uh, you can use any value on the graph choose any relevant value that has a good cross point good cross point means that the grid of the axis print out and the actual crossing on the of the curve actually has a good intersection so choose such a point read out this value from here from here and you can calculate the here so choosing any value is good as long as your choice of your uh, intersection point is a uh, good one try number c c number is what i'm really interested about and i want you to find out a way to calculate out answer of question number c shuru theke age kore asho yong sonlas ta na korle c number ar pochhte parbo na c number korte ar jonno yong sonlas lagbe so eta calculate kore asho tarpor c number ta try kor i'll help you for this thing sir copy to scroll down korben dekhte pacchi kunta copy to scroll down korben Oh yeah, sure. I think, yeah, this one should do.
Sir, are you saying something? You're yes, muted. I, oh, I was muted? Yes, sir. Yes, Oops. sir. These are up in your Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, I'll say it again. Let me try to explain what is happening over here. So I'm trying to explain what is happening over here. Uh, what I'm trying to mean is that if we have a material of this shape, let's say there is a large sphere of bubble inside this thing and we are trying to apply force on two opposite sides. Let's try and understand how that force would affect different cross-section of this thing. You have to understand that it is the cross-sectional area of the metal that causes the uh, resistance against the deformation. I mean, if you don't have metal, if you have air or if you have air bubble or missing material, you cannot have that physical resistance of, uh, I mean, uh, resistance toward against deformation. What I try to mean is if we consider defined section of the cylindrical rod along its length, this, this cross section on the very left one, this is gonna give you a perfect solid cross section. So you're gonna get a full metallic uh, uh, circle if you're in this cross section. For this slice, for this second slice, we're gonna get something of a little bit of metal missing. So if I try to show this up in a side view, let's say this is the cross sectional view of the metal. This is the total solid cross, cross sectional view. Let me uh, plot it all together with, with this. This is the metal color. Whenever you have this slice, a small part of the material would be would be missed out. So let's say I'm gonna do this one with this one and fill with a solid color of so let's say at this cross section area, this much material would be missing. If I slowly slowly go from left to right, exactly at the middle, the total amount of missing area would be the biggest so the material would be the lowest over here so what i want you to understand when the when the cross-sectional circle is small which means we are considering a, 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 a not the exact middle part of the of the whole sphere the amount of remaining material is the border material the further you go on the right side this circle slowly becomes bigger this white circle slowly becomes bigger up to the diameter point and as this white circle becomes bigger it means that as the void or the bubble becomes bigger the material which is responsible to withstand the force that is becoming smaller in the formula that we write that y equals to oh this is right okay in the formula that we write that y equals to fl by a e fl by a e this cross-sectional area is the actual cross-sectional area of the material so in true sense this cross-sectional area would actually mean this ash colored area not the whole whole thing so how can we apply this idea for our math? Let me work it out for you. Here in this question, they say that the Young's modulus, Young's modulus, I'm here Young's modulus calculator, Koto Ash data. Anyone? The value of Koto Ash? Hello. I mean, you have to work it to the hater answer to who say nine air B nine B on solar scotta shit to him. The amount the hell I pay. Then we also know such a seven point three into the about ten pascal. Okay, fine. So the way we should be able to write this formula is that let's say seven point three into ten to the about ten pascal. If the break break happens in this specimen, the break will happen at the smallest cross section area because at the smallest cross section area the stress would be the highest so that's sort of like the weakest point of the whole whole specimen equals to force which is 1.9 into 10 to the power 3 
Isn't that the length? Yes. The length of the specimen is it given? ओके so we can go for a set of bad stress equals to have hoche force by area a stress ta ashbe hoche kot theke a stress er value ta ashbe hoche uh yon sol loss er value which means 7.3 divided by 10 and stress equals to hoche force is supposed to be 1.9 divided by 3 So young's modulus value cannot stress of it. Sorry, 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 sorry. स्ट्रेस बै करते available stress hot shei tuk stress hot to force by force to force no dara eta kal kuchu kichu ta mess up korchi फिज